ready for the finish line. Bill Monty and the first female special. Nineteen seventy, and uh, Bill has a new wife and a, a son on the way, and a, a new owner, Lee Shaneth, out of Detroit. A new sponsor, uh, Mirror Sheet Metal, and it's just very exciting. So the first race that year was nineteen seventy was Tampa, Florida, and I remember the conditions were were pretty bad, pre-storm uh, weather. Uh, great big white caps, so there were lots of delays. I don't think he did very well. The next race was Washington, D.C., and um, he won that race. You're one of the great figures in uh, unlimited racing, of course, Bill. What have you been able to teach Muncie about driving this year? Well, I don't think you can teach Muncie uh, anything about driving. He has his own techniques, and once a, a person gets those, why? Then he follows them through, and so they've been pretty successful. So I don't think you could do any improvement on his driving. We may do some improvement on the boat and the equipment, but uh, for a driver, I don't think we could do any better. We've hit it off quite well, Bill and I, uh, ever since I've known Bill when he first started driving. And uh, uh, he has uh, ideas. I have ideas, and we sit down and thrash them out. And see, no one, I, not just being the chief, I'm just uh, a guy that tried to add my experience on to make a successful boat out of it and getting the best driver that I can for the boat. The year that I drove Park Oil Ring Miss was probably the one of the worst years in, in uh, unlimited racing that I had had for a full season. Um, we didn't know what to really expect from the boat. It, it didn't perform as well as we had hoped right from the beginning. Um, and once again we raced at the uh, Suncoast Cup, I think they called it in Tampa, and the water was rough. And so we didn't really get a chance to see what the boat would do there. We went to the next race in Washington, D.C., and um, I thought that this is, the, this is the chance for me to really let this thing out and, and, and see how it would run. Well, at full throttle, it would go down the race course just kind of back and forth, like it, it wouldn't steer properly. And uh, Bill was on, I remember Bill Muncy was on my outside, and I got up to the first corner, and, and it was doing that. I decelerated a little for the turn and started a turn, and it rolled right over on its side to the point where I got hit on the shoulder and head with water. And then it popped back down straight again, and, um, and so that made my corner pretty weird. Well, Bill was on my outside, and I'm glad he was the one that was there. I might not be talking to you right now. Um, I think that having a great driver next to me on a situation like that was was really fortunate. Um, after that, he would Bill would come up to me and tell me to you know to watch that boat a little bit, you know, because it was kind of hairy. And I, and I said I told him similar to what he would have told me. I says it was a lot hairier from where I was sitting. You know, because I, I had never driven anything quite like that. And it, and it just continued to get worse all year. Um, he would occasionally just come up and discuss the boat with me. And we, we mostly were, were talking about the design of it and the fact that there was just not much that could be done. Bill, uh, you're having a, a difficult time this year. And I don't imagine that uh, certainly you're not used to it. Uh, how does Bill Shoemaker feel inside about the year he's having thus far? Well, so far, I've wanted to give up about eight times. Uh, I'm not going to yet. We, we still have changes that we think should be made in the boat. Uh, believe it or not, we, we've made changes from the beginning that we're going right back to now. And uh, we're looking forward to a successful race here. Uh, the water is more in your favor, of course, because it'll probably get rough. Why would you take such a, an earth-shattering, revolutionary, successful design as the Miss Bardall and change it? Well, basically, uh, the reason for that was that Notre Dame at one time was flying. Uh, and you get a lot of opinions, uh, some of which I listened to where I shouldn't have, in the fact that the boat was flying. So we decided to narrow it down eight inches in the wind tunnel to keep it down in the water because our boat was going to be lighter yet. Unfortunately, it came out as heavier or heavier than the Bardall did, and so our changes went from <laughs> what we thought were going to be good to very bad. Hey, I know uh, in the interest of hydroplane racing, uh, a direct question I'm sure everybody would be interested in is, uh, why is a guy as uh, 
as talented and as attractive as you are, why are you a single man? Well, because I, I can't make enough money to support myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main reason. <laughs> well, certainly uh, you attract the hearts of a lot of people around the country, and it's uh, been a fascinating experience. My wife wants to know, why is a good-looking guy like that single? And maybe I said because he likes being single. What's your wife doing tonight? <laughs> well, she has lousy taste in men. <laughs> she picked me. Bill loved racing for Lee Shaneth. That year with Mirror Sheet Metal, Bill did all he could to try to get attention to Mirror Sheet Metal, um, but it was just a, a regional company and, and there just wasn't, a, well, he, he, he tried hard, but uh, he knew that he needed a, a, they needed a national sponsor. And he had always admired O.H. Frisbee, who was the uh, chairman of Atlas Van Lines. He was the founder also, uh, and, and O.H. Frisbee was a great fan of unlimited hydroplane racing, and he had a, um, a penthouse clear up on one of the very tallest buildings right on the Detroit River, just before the Belle Isle Bridge. And so every year he would entertain, and, and he had dabbled in, boat ra in the unlimited racing. Uh, uh, he hadn't been successful. Um, but that he uh, contacted Lee Shaneth and, and uh, said, you know, I really admire Bill Muncy and I think if you have a great team now, do you, do you think that you'd be interested or Bill would it be interested in driving and having a, the Atlas Van Line sponsorship? And they tried it and uh, I think the rest is history. I mean, he soon became um, vice president of marketing for Atlas Van Lines worldwide and uh, just spoke all over the country. Marcus are just doing great in that hallmark. He's really making a move. Here comes Muncie on the outside again, pushing Borgerson for all he's worth. Muncie's pushing Borgerson. Atlas Van Lines moving up on the outside now. Hallmark Holmes on top, but Atlas Van Lines moving. Budweiser is still third, Madison fourth. A great race here for first and second. And here's Muncie moving up on the outside in Atlas Van Lines. The Atlas Van Lines is moving up. Moving up, moving up, on the Hallmark Holmes. Let's see if he gets him in that corner. Let's go up to that corner. Look out, the Hallmark Holmes went way up in the air, came down nose first, but they murdered him. Got him under control. 98.98, that rough water slowing him down, Jim. Late Borgerson got a big... And right now, he's going to try to challenge right now. Here's the Hallmark Holmes going in, the green flag, which means one more lap to go once they cross the finish line here. And it's going to be the Hallmark Holmes completion of lap number five with about a one and a half second lead over the Atlas Van Lines with Bill Muncy. And Jim, Atlas Van Lines is about one half lap away from winning a President's Cup. Bill Muncy will have a thousand points if he can hang in there with Leif Borgerson. Ferguson moving up the back stretch at Hallmark Holmes. He's doing a fine job. Here he comes, Leif Ferguson in the Hallmark Holmes. And let's give him a big wave of greeting as he comes across the line. The winner of the final heat, Leif Ferguson in Hallmark Holmes. The winner, the second place finisher, Atlas Van Lines, the second place finisher in the final heat. Folks, I'm with three very happy people. I'm Guy Lombardo. My hobby is speedboat racing. And here I'm with Bill Muncy, who today won the President's Cup for the fifth time. And no one else can claim that distinction. Bill, congratulations. Thank you, Guy. On Bill's right is Mr. Frisbee, who sponsors the boat, Atlas Van Lines. And on my left, V. Shoneth, who's famous for the Gale boats. And he designed and is also owner of the Atlas Van Line boats. So to all of you, my hearty congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. This has got to be one of the nicest Thank things you. that have ever happened. Guys. Thank you, Bill. To get Bill. it from you, to get it from you, to get it from Guy Lombardo is just a delightful thing for me. Well, I've never you, been so excited. Just this crowd, we're all with you, Bill. I could uh, <laughs> tell by the way you came out that it was all a Bill Muncy crowd. Oh, rightly so, Bill, because. When you've won this President's Cup, it's the most famous cup probably in the world, other than the Gold Cup, maybe the most famous, to have won that four times before, you've certainly got to be the idol of these people here in Washington. <laughs> you have been racing boats out here for many years. A long, long time. And I think that I, 
I don't want to sound like I misdirected. A lot of people say, well, any guy that would stay in racing that long has to come as a result of a misspent youth, but that isn't true. I, <laughs> I'm delighted I could get into racing and devote my life to it, and I'm just pleased that I could be successful. Now, here's a twist, folks. Bill's hobby, Bill's hobby is music. He's a great jazz saxophone player. My business is music. And my hobby is speedboating, so we're rather two of the kind. Yes, but you've had a chance to participate very successfully in music, and tonight I want you to know that I'm going to be able to set in and play with the Guy Lombardo Orchestra over at Borling Air Force Base, and this is something I want to do all my life. Uh, Bill, do you remember our first race? Who was it, who we were with? Guy and he was Detroit. Running, and you were driving and I was riding. We were both <laughs> racing against him. <laughs> Well, the happiest days of my life. Hey, let me see this. I've been in speedboat racing. And I wish I could do it all over again, but um, we're not supposed to do things all over I again. I want to right? tell you and everybody that I don't think that there's a sport in our country today that can, well, it has an individual like Guy Lombardo with which the public can identify so quickly. Every place you go, even though I've been a pro 21 years, everybody says, oh, is that one of those boats that Guy Lombardo drives? And we say, you bet, that's the kind that Guy's got. And I'm glad that... He could come and race along well, with us. I'm mighty proud of that, Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, actually, you happy, huh? Uh, well, I'm very happy, but Bill. You can believe it. This is our fifth year in racing, and when we, when the first race we win is the President's Cup, you know how happy I am. <laughs> I've got two bosses, this one and this one. Now you can speak. <laughs> I'm very happy. How about your wife? <laughs> the fourth That's time I won is my other one. to win again. Francis, come here quickly. Come here. She's, She's not bosses, happy. She's not very happy. <laughs> She turned out pretty good for a girl. <laughs> so one night, we're on the stand somewhere playing, and I get this long-distance phone call. And uh, it's Bill. And Bill says, I'm in Detroit, or wherever he was. And I said, yeah, what's going on? He says, you won't believe it. I finally have made it. I finally was a featured solo with, uh, with the Guy Lombardo band. This means more to me than anything else. He says, I've taped it, and I've got to give you the tape. Well, I don't know whatever happened to the tape, but he was absolutely enthralled that he got a chance to play as the solos with Guy Lombardo's band, and that, that was a great thing for him. The banks of the Ohio River as it flows by the community of Madison, Indiana, a population about 13,000 on a soft summer day. But it's the setting today with more than 100,000 people to watch the Gold Cup race for unlimited hydroplane. It's an American folklore festival where thousands and thousands have come to enjoy themselves and just have some fun. Hello, I'm Keith Jackson. And you're about to see today on ABC's Wide World of Sports what we call the Thunderboats. The unlimited hydroplanes, the powerhouses of boat racing, run for the Gold Cup. This is the Grand Prix for the unlimited hydroplanes. This is the one every boat owner, every driver, every mechanic, every man in boat racing strives to win at one time or another because this is the top prize. The Atlas taking a run at the butt now on the long straight. And the Atlas bouncing, banging, and something is torn loose. Looks like a sponson has ripped off, water spewing up, but that should bring out the red flares and the red flags. There they are, and the race has been stopped. And when you lose that much of your boat, that suddenly, obviously, you've got a hole in it, and there you see the result. Bill Muncy is still in the cockpit. There is no fire, no apparent danger to him, but the boat is sinking. He tried to run it as far as he could over towards shore so that if it does sink, it'll sink in shallow water, making it much easier to get it out. So as Bill Muncy takes to the water for a short swim and his boat settles to the bottom, the race has been stopped. Let's see if we can find out what happened. Bill? All I did was develop an oil leak uh, during a warm-up and I couldn't see so I had to throw my goggles off and I hit some rollers. No, I'm fine. I didn't get a mark, really. Your chest all right? Yeah, I just Blake? out of breath. It just knocked the wind out of me. I'm just a great shape. I'm you really broke fun. my toy. I know it. I lost our gold <laughs> cup. That's where I hurt. Oh, right you're okay. We can fix the boat. Bill is on probation, and this happened at Madison, Indiana. Uh, we have a rule, Rule 35, that specifies we must see the three boat link. Uh, overlap. At least or overlap. Past the right. overlap. Right. Now, the overlap rule prior to this 
uh, what we did at driver's meetings was to explain this, but evidently last year uh, Bill claimed that he hadn't heard it too often or didn't hear it and wasn't aware of it. So as you know, last year in Seattle here, uh, we did have a problem with Bill and also at San Diego. Now, uh, at Madison, Bill, from the way our referee saw it, uh, coming up into the turn with uh, Atlas in front and on the inside lane, the Notre Dame, Bill in his turn swung in and there was only, uh, let's say, 10 feet. So this is mighty close and this is why this was called on Bill. Now, I have had letters written from people in Seattle and all over the country to me. Why didn't I beach Bill? Well, Bill has been quite an asset to this sport. Bill is a good driver. Uh, we're not picking on Bill in any uh, uh, way, shape, or form. Uh, Bill is one of my pros, and I consider Bill one of our leaders. And I expect Bill uh, to do a little bit better job. Now, Bill went to Pasco. We had a closed-door meeting, as most of you people read about, and uh, to get some of the pressure off of Bill, because we don't intend to put that kind of pressure on him. And uh, Bill understood the situation. He came out at Pasco and drove a very good race and ended up second. Now, Bill has the talent uh, to do this. He can win a race without getting into any problems, and I'm sure of that. He would be so upset at uh, the referee, uh, Bill Newton, in the 70s, and he just knew Bill Newton was out to get him. He finally went to John Owen, a uh, Seattle um, sports writer, and just had a very serious talk with him and, and said, this is happening to me, and you know, I, I don't know what to do. There's really nothing I can do about it. Uh, just to let him know what was going on, you know, that he wasn't being just a bad sport, and he gave him lots of instances that he hadn't really done it, and uh, so there were, four, there were 14 races, and he uh, documented them with John Owen, and, uh, but that's really all he could do about it. When he made some of his outside starts that where he squeezed the field down or cut them off, um, he usually did it uh, in, in a style that, that upset everybody, but he also, quite honestly, would leave room for these boats. He wouldn't leave enough room for them to slide, though. And the rules say that if you leave them room, at that point anyway, if you left them room, they, that was a legal deal. And uh, you, in some cases, you had to say, well, he wasn't wrong in what he did. There were some other cases where I think it was pretty blatant that the, the other boat didn't have a chance to get through that. Um, and uh, and it, would, it would upset some people. I think Bill was um, saddened that other people were upset with him. He really didn't, you know, and I'd heard a lot of uh, times when he would come in, people would actually boo him. They would uh, make gestures that were unkindly, and I think that uh, that upset him a lot because he, he was probably one of the best things the sport has ever had. As far as promoting it goes, it was, without question in my mind, the best driver there, that there's ever been. I think that um, to see somebody like that upset and that disturbed over other people's reactions toward him, uh, towards him uh, really bothered me to see that happen. So, There's no question, but uh, Muncie hated to lose. And in, in, the, in the perspective of some, uh, I think uh, that uh, they may have felt he was a, a bit of a whiner. Uh, he didn't have any problem about going to bend in the ear of uh, the commission or a, a referee or, or getting a little copy going. And, and he was always looking for an edge. He was a competitor. And uh, that's what people do who are in that kind of business. They constantly seek an edge. This has got to be, Jim, from uh, not only from the point of view of Madisonians, but uh, certainly the life and the career of one Jim McCormick, one of the happiest and most uh, fun seasons that you've ever been exposed to. Bill, there's no question about that. I mean, I dreamed about winning the Gold Cup for many, many years, and uh, to win the Gold Cup and to back it up with an Atomic Cup win. And like you say, we are on top right now point-wise by only a very thin margin, though. With We'd sure like to keep that thin margin for the rest of the few races and end up with a national championship. And of course, we're the crew's very high on it, and we're going to give 100% to try to do that. 
Hey, it isn't that you haven't made the effort every year to be a winner. Uh, you have made that effort, and uh, the crew certainly, and everybody in Madison has made the effort to support you. Uh, what, what, can you attribute it to any single thing, or was it in fact something very exotic that Harry had in his hip pocket? And well, Harry was, to Jim McCormick. Harry was certainly a lot of help, Bill. As you know, I mean, we've had a lot of racing luck. We've had a lot of good breaks. Uh, anybody that wins has them. Uh, the crew has worked very hard. Uh, they've learned a lot of things about Allison engines in the last two or three years that, uh, to get a few more horsepower out of it. Uh, Harry and uh, Everett Adams helped us out very much with our ADI system. We've been playing with it for three years and never now, had... Now, wait a minute. Slow you down. ADI. To the average person, they're not really aware of what that is. Well, ADI is anti-detonation injection or water alcohol injection that keeps the manifold temperatures down. We've been running very high manifold temperatures and losing horsepower for that reason. Well, whatever you're pulling out of that medicine, it's sure working, Jim. And, uh, you know, uh, you hear a lot of people say, talk about luck and all that kind of thing. I was in that race. I lost. And uh, I don't believe in luck. I just did think you did a magnificent job. It was a beautiful, it was a pretty thing. I saw it on, uh, on television afterwards. It was just a beautiful job of driving, and I was mighty proud. And uh, we're glad you're coming here in number one, but we're going to make you keep pumped up, you know. <laughs> well, Bill, thank you very much for the compliments. And uh, coming from you, I really appreciate it, really. And we had, like I say, we had a few breaks, and uh, we happened to get out in front. And when, it's, when you get out in front, you know, it's, it's worth about 10 mile an hour in anybody's book. <laughs> Jim McCormick, the driver of the... National champion leader right at this point, the Miss Madison. The President's Conference on Physical Fitness, a program designed to get the attention of everybody, not just young people, to the need for being physically fit and being strong, and how important and how, how much real value your life can have if you stay in reasonably good condition. One day, got a call from the President of the United States. It was President Nixon, his office, and wanted Bill Muncy to contact them. So uh, I got a hold of Bill. He was traveling for Atlas Van Line someplace, and he called them, and it was a, that they wanted him to be on the President's Council of Physical Fitness and Sports and come to Washington, D.C. And so um, we did that, went to Washington, D.C., and uh, went to the White House and met President Nixon and his wife, Pat, First Lady, and it was just a wonderful day. Uh, the only people that in motorsports that were selected were Andy Granatelli, Richard Petty, and Bill Muncy on the President's Council of Physical Fitness and Sports. Hi, I'm Bill Muncy. I drive that red, white, and blue hydroplane, and I'm a Navy man. The Navy offers you an opportunity to take a casual but objective look at the whole world to be sure what part you'll play in it. A serious look at a number of vocations. When you add all of the extras, when your pay is probably doubled on enlistment, what most college graduates receive when they first enter the labor market. With Navy enlistments involving two to six year programs, including education, you really spend the whole time discovering yourself, deciding exactly what you're going to do to assure a rich, rewarding life. So take a look at the Navy. I really think you should seriously consider it. The Navy had just done a way with the draft and so now Admiral Tidd was in charge of recruiting for the Navy. So he contacted Bill and asked if he'd be interested in representing the Navy. And Bill was so excited about that. He uh, visited Pensacola and uh, uh, spoke to them and just was so impressed with all those fine young pilots. And um, they used to, they would recruit or uh, have the swearing-in ceremonies in the different pit areas around the United States, standing up on the hydroplane. So it just brought so much to the sport, and that's what Bill was always trying to do, is just bring uh, greatness to the sport. Mm -hmm. 1972, oh, what a great year that was. Uh, there were only seven events, but he won six of them, including the, the Gold Cup. This is the important one for Budweiser and Atlas. They can both win this championship today if they get a win in this heat. And looks like Budweiser is up in the pack and Atlas is back in the pack. And it'll be a lot of driving on the part of Bill Muncy to make a race out of this one. 
They come around the turn on the outside. That is Town Club moving up to the lead, but look on the inside. It's Bill Muncy moving up very quickly between boats and challenging for the lead with Town Club. They move through three and four, and Town Club appears to be out of it, but look who's moving up on the inside now. It's Budweiser. On the inside, Budweiser. On the outside, it's Atlas, and these are the two that'll have to battle it out for today's championship, and Bill Muncy is really pouring the coal to it as he moves around turn four. They're nose to nose, and those rooster tails could be dangerous if they get behind one another, but Bill Muncy doesn't appear to want to do that. He's moving out and taking the lead by about a boat length and a half. Third and fourth place now going to Timex and Hay and Pack. They move out of turn four again, and now Bill Muncy and Atlas have really opened up that lead to about 17 boat lengths. And look at the choppy water here. This could be very dangerous. That boat is starting to capitate a little bit, but Bill Muncy's experience over many years of hydroplane driving will probably take care of any little minor difficulties such as that. Here's Town Club now pouring the nitrous oxide to it. That's the smoke you see. No danger there. That's just a little more power, but I'm afraid that won't help in this case. Here's Bill Muncy now moving down the back stretch on the final lap, and he has opened approximately a fourth of a lap on Miss Budweiser. Bill Muncy and Atlas going for another win in a tremendous season of winning for the boat and the driver. Here comes Miss Budweiser around the final turn. Second place, not bad for a day's work, but the win today and all the honors go to Bill Muncy and the Atlas Bandline Special. The Gold Cup that year would be his fifth uh, gold Cup, and only Gar Wood had won five Gold Cups. So, oh, the pressure was on, and it was in Detroit, his hometown, and and uh, Lee Shaneth and Bill Cantrell was his crew chief, and oh, he wanted to win this Gold Cup. You know, it was just a part of history. And plus, the Gold Cup was more important to him than any other race. It was more important than uh, national championships, just anything. But that was just a, a, a perfect day. He won every heat. Uh, it, it was just a glorious day. I guess I've never seen him so excited uh, about a win and just so happy as that fifth Gold Cup in Detroit. Really, there were so many highlights in the year that the one setback seems to stick out like a sore thumb. It was in Washington, D.C. We were running for the President's Cup, which we'd won in 1971, our first victory for Atlas. We'd won the two preliminary heats in which we were entered, and Seattle's pride of pay and pack have won both its preliminary heats as well. So we went into the final race dead even as far as points were concerned, and it was one of the most exciting races I've ever been in. First Pay and Pack had the lead, then we had it, then Pay and Pack, then us. We held the lead going into the final lap when I began lapping some slower boats, and somehow I momentarily got caught in the traffic, and when I finally got around them, I was looking at Pay and Pack's rooster tail, the backside as it were. We made a charge for the wire, but there just wasn't enough time. That was the low point, really, of the 1972 season, the second place in Washington, D.C. The Notre Dame is bunched up in the middle. Muncie is way back, way back, Mike. He's way back in the pack, but maybe he'll get a run at it. On the extreme inside is the butt, and we've got the Notre Dame, and they explain outside as the man CX, and Muncie shooting up the middle. Here they come. On the inside. The Budweiser's on the inside. Muncie's right in the middle of the pack. He's flying. He may take the lead at the start. On the inside, the Budweiser. Muncie in the middle. Here they go into the south turn. It's anybody's boat race. The Pizza Pete is in the middle. The Atlas is in the middle. The Notre Dame took it across the starting line. Way on the outside is the Van CX. We got a boat race. Four one going right down into that turn. And you see it right there on King into the corner. That's Muncie and the Notre Dame. The Notre Dame is coming out of that corner, number one, it looks like. On the outside is Muncie, Notre Dame, Muncie, Notre Dame, Muncie, 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 Muncie! Bill Muncie turning it on ahead of the Notre Dame, and he just pulls away from the gentleman. He's got it to the full board, that baby screaming! On the inside of Notre Dame, way back to Budweiser. The boat race is Atlas, Atlas, and Muncie is ahead. He's pulling away from the Notre Dame, and Chenoweth is pushing it to the floorboard. He's got a boat race. He's led all the way. There's your winner, if he can make it. And the Atlas crew can cross their fingers now, because here he comes, the checkered flag. The checkered flag is off. Bill Muncie's coming in real close to the margin at this point. Oh, look at him come. You reach out and touch him. Woo! He's flying. He knows he's got it. He can post in now. He's a winner. So 
let's get underway and meet Shirley. our first Shirley. challenger. So will you enter and sign in, please? Shirley's going to defeat the power. Bill Muncie. Mr. Muncie? Where did you get the suit? Never mind the rest of this show. You bought it new. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Muncie, where are you from? I'm from San Diego, California. All right, panel. Bill Muncie is a champion. Now, he's had more victories in his sport than any other man in history. Let's show the audience just what kind of a champion Bill Muncie is. You must find out what kind of a champion, and we'll begin with Anita Gillette. Do you move around a good deal when you're doing uh, this? Uh, yes, very much. You mm -hmm. move around a good deal. Uh, do you, um, do you, does it require a lot of balance? On his part? Yes. No, no. Five down, Gene yeah. Shaw. Have we established that, Wally, that this is too heavy to lift, but he lifts it anyhow? No, we haven't established that. Oh, we haven't established that. that. I thought, oh. We have 10 seconds. We have? Uh -huh. We have eight seconds now. Now it's five. Seven. <laughs> Anyone have a guess? a guess? Is it anything to do with the water? Are you in a boat? Are you a speed uh, racer like with the big mo? Yes, hydroplane. <laughs> Kick, but Bill Muncie is the most famous unlimited hydroplane racing champion in the world. He's been the winner of the President's Cup five times, the Gold Cup winner four times, twice world champion, and even more. And he's in the Hall of Fame and still manages to be director of corporate relations for Atlas Van Lines worldwide. And were you the skipper that gave Arlene her ride in Seattle that time? No, I wasn't. That must be how you got it. <laughs> I was thinking of the man that had the big mo. What was his name? Stan Sayers. And Stan I was Sayers. there the day you took your ride. Oh, I hate really? to admit, that was some time ago. Why haven't we met since? <laughs> oh, I don't know. You, be, you well, became very I, famous you and I became out, infamous. <laughs> Why you have such muscles in your arms if you just drive a, a boat? Well, he picks oh, it yeah. up out of the water. <laughs> it's it's taking it off the trailer, but no. <laughs> it's hard work, isn't it, Bill? It really indeed is. Uh, our boats are about 7,000 pounds, and uh, we have about 3,000 horsepower available to us uh, to make us go fast. And as a result of this horsepower, there's a great deal of torque, and it all wants to turn left. Uh -huh. The idea, of course, is to make it go straight, and at a certain time when you get to the corner, make it turn left. And you have to stay in reasonably good shape, and at my age, it's a little more difficult than it used to be, but... I work very hard at that, too. <laughs> Bill, can you, can you describe a hydroplane for those of us who... Our boats are generally 28 to 31 feet long. As I mentioned, they weigh about 7,000 pounds. They accelerate from 90 to 150 miles an hour in about five seconds. We run uh, under the auspices and sanks to the American Power Boat Association in 10 events around the nation each year in a four-month season. And we run on three miles and uh, two and a half mile race courses, uh, which gives us, uh, in the straightaway, about 160 miles an hour. The world's record's 200. And uh, it, there's a great deal of interest in our sport, ev most everywhere except, I think, the Northeast. And around here, the most famous, around New York at least, the most famous boat driver in history by far, uh, uh, a Pied Piper in our sport was Guy Lombardo. Oh, yeah. right. Now, uh, wh why is this so dangerous? I think it's because yeah. we're riding on a, a few square inches of wetted surface. We're virtually water-bound airplanes. And uh, you want to keep them in a minimum of friction areas, but you want to keep them fast. And so you try and keep them high, but on the water. It's and, scary. Uh, yeah. It is a little Have frightening. You've been way off. I've had some interesting incidents. Uh, one time I uh, sank a Coast Guard boat. I became the first man to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had a couple disintegrate and a couple to blow up. And, uh, but I have been in the sport uh, a very long time, and I'm, I'm mighty glad that I could have been involved this long. Well, Bill Muncy, we're delighted you could take time to join us on What's oh, My Line. You continued success in your choice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What's My Line will continue right after this word. Bill Muncy here taking a moment to pay tribute to a little lady. Mrs. Butterworth, once again, she's helping sponsor our TV coverage of Seafair. And if you're like me, you already know how good Mrs. Butterworth's original buttered syrup really is. Damn. It looks like the pay and pack will take with the Budweiser the lead on the start. Budweiser, Budweiser, Budweiser. A 
Budweiser on the inside, slamming into the south turn, on his hip, the pay and back, and on the outside is the Atlas Van Lines, and then they string out from there for the Red Man, and the uh, Pizza Pete and the Greenfield, so going into the south turn, you see the Budweiser on the inside, and Mr. Riemann, on the outside in the pay and pack. The pay and pack has taken the lead now with the Budweiser on the inside. But here's where the Budweiser generally accelerates. We'll see if that new engine has it. The equipment that he had been running for, for Lee Sheenoff was actually, it had been good equipment, but uh, technology moves on. And, and when we came out with the honeycomb pay and pack, uh, that really took the boats a notch up. And people didn't realize that, that, that uh, the die had already been cast for the fact that the boats were going to improve drastically. And, and the people that stayed with the existing technology ended up getting left behind because we sold the gold boat to Budweiser. They ran it very well. We built the new you know, white pan pack and those two boats just dominated everything for the next three years. Uh, and it wasn't until people decided, wait a minute, we, we need to build boats like those in order to compete that, uh, that everybody started catching up. On the inside, the pack. On the outside, the Budweiser. The pack is on the inside. The Bud on the outside. Here they come. It's going to be close. The checkered flag is out. The pay it back. The pay it back has got it. The Budweiser almost nipped him, Mike. Almost nipped him. The pride of pay and pack, as you know. 1973 world champion by, I would say, less than a boat length. The hardest years on Bill were 1974-75, he was still driving for Lee Shaneth. And the team got the bright idea of uh, trying out Allison engines and turbocharging them. It had never been perfected, uh, and the technology wasn't really developed. I think it was in car racing, but not in boat racing. So they tried, and they tried, and they tried. The uh, gale boats were heavy, and uh, the new uh, pan pack boats were made with the honeycomb aluminum to save weight, and it was working. And so I guess the answer to that with the gale team was to, to develop more power which they thought they could do with the Allison because supposedly they have this, the strong basement and add the turbocharging instead of the um, blower and that, that, it should, that it should work. So I think that's the direction they were going is to try to beat them with power. The Tri-Cities race in 74, the final heat was one of those things where everything that could go wrong did go wrong for Bill. Bill was the alternate, and that meant that he was allowed to leave the pits at the, uh, the five-minute gun, and if there weren't enough boats on the course and running at the one-minute gun, he could make a legal start. However, if all the boats were running, he was supposed to shut it off and go to the infield. So Ron Armstrong was driving the Value Mart, and the guys on the Value Mart crew had not opened up the nitrous bottles. And during the, the five minute period, you'd check the nitrous, you check all sorts of things. Well, he discovered that the nitrous bottles weren't working and he figured, well, they just haven't opened up the valves. So he shuts the boat off, gets out, goes up front, reaches on the cowling and opens up the nitrous valves. Well, Bill drives by, sees the boat stopped, sees the driver with his head under the cowling and figures, I'm in the race, no problem. So he goes to make his start. Well, in the meantime, the value market gets restarted, gets back on the race course. So instead of there being six boats going in the first turn, there are seven boats. Well, 
everybody squeezes into that first turn and the, the Atlas goes through three rooster tails at least, slides into the U95 and the bow of his boat hits the tail fin on the U95. Um, and the U95 was, was poised to perhaps be the first turbine boat to win a race. Well, they get back to the pits and everybody's furious. Bill is immediately accosted by members of the U95 crew as he comes up the, the dock and they say, Yo, you hit our boat, you did it on purpose, you took our boat out, uh, you took our boat out of the race. And Bill, you know, he's, he's a little bit angry and he does what maybe a lot of us do when we're kids and we get accused of doing something. I didn't do that, that didn't happen. Um, well, once his boat got back on the trailer and they could see that there was paint from the U95 all over the bow of the boat, they quickly covered the bow of Bill's boat with a tarp and continued to, to claim innocence. When the U95 lost their tail fin, that was it. They didn't have another one. So that the next week, uh, the, the Gold Cup in Seattle, the, uh, the U95 ran without their tail. And the, the owner of the boat, Pam Clapp, was, and Chuck Lyford were still really mad at Bill. And they were sort of out for blood. So to symbolize this, on the bow of the boat, they painted uh, shark's teeth, like uh, the P-40 Tomahawks from, um, from the Flying Tiger Squadron in, in China in World War II. Midway through the first heat uh, in the Gold Cup, the U-95 blew a hot section and threw blades through the bottom of the boat, and the U-95 sank. But as it sank, it turned, and the shark's teeth just stood up out of the water, and that's all you could see as the boat went down. Look at that! It's sinking! The U-95, the turbine-powered boat, Jim Clapp's conceived idea carried on by his widow. The 75 Atlas was one of the first unlimiteds that John Stodecker built, and it was an attempt to incorporate some of the West Coast pay and pack technology, the deep pickle fork, the wide transom, um, that type of technology into an East Coast uh, typical Stodeker heavy river boat. And it was a big disappointment, but it, it wasn't just that the boat didn't work. They were also trying some pretty uh, exotic things with the engines and combination of a new boat and new engines and neither of them really, uh, really worked out. And, uh, it was a long year for, for poor Bill. Here comes the Atlas Van Line. What a rough ride our co-announcer, Bill Punsey, is getting today. Punsey, hang on. He's had problems with this boat all year. Look at the smoke come off the Shenandoah. He's really cooked an engine. And here comes our leader right through the fog, right in the daylight, not giving up. The seasons uh, 73, 74, 75, Bill did not win a race, and it was just so frustrating. But most of all, it was just it's so embarrassing to him with a, a great sponsor and the Navy and the uh, all the... President's Council, physical fitness people, all the people he'd brought into the sport. It was just such an embarrassment. Finally, he told Lee, he said, I'm, you know, I'm too old to be doing this experimenting. Uh, you know, I, I need, to, uh, need to win for the sponsors. I, you know, I just can't do this anymore. And uh, Lee felt badly about it too. And so he, he released Bill from the contract and decided that he too just, just couldn't go on um, and he'd already sold all of his Merlin equipment, his Rolls-Royce equipment, so Bill left the team and uh, Lee Shaneth retired the team. <laughs>